The Call Confessions is brought to you commercial free by the generous support of our patrons. Visit occultconfessions.com and press donate to help keep the history of the occult on the digital airwaves. Panic struck the Tokyo subway on the 20th of March 1995. Men boarded subway cars with plastic bags and umbrellas, removed the newspaper covering the bags, and punctured them with the sharp tips of the umbrellas releasing sarin gas, a biological weapon first developed by the Nazis during World War II, and they released this into the underground. Eight of eleven bags were broken open and leaked 159 ounces of liquid sarin onto the cars as they hurtled through the subway system. Twelve people were killed. 1,039 were injured, and 4,460 went to the hospital reporting symptoms of exposure. The men who released the gas were members of Aum Shinrikyo, a religious organization founded by Shoko Asahara in 1987, and they were hoping to spark an Armageddon, namely, war between Japan and the United States, according to their gurus designs. My name is Dr. Robert C. Thompson, joined this day by our metallurgic prophet, Brie Litterall. Hey, guys. And Brie, you are somewhat of a, a closet expert on Aum Shinrikyo, yes? Yes, I am. In fact, I wrote two whole papers about them for you in your class. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. You, you've been begging to be on this episode for years. I... <laughs> <laughs> you don't understand my fascination, disgust, and complete interest in this cult. Like it's it's wild. And the naked truth, uh, Nikki Double H, Nikki Hiller Henderson, uh, back with Bree again. What's up, Nikki? Hello, hello. How are things? You know what? They're going. They're going. Yeah, yeah. You're, you're going through some stuff, but that's. But we're here to talk about Japanese cults so <laughs> i've actually heard of this one i thought i hadn't all right the sarin gas attack yes it was a little bit before your time right or no it was around your when you were born oh. well i mean that's not when i heard of it but <laughs> <laughs> you pop out of the vagina and somebody's like hey kid there was an attack in a tokyo subway just wanted you to know welcome to the world <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> but right you were you would have been were you alive yet? What year were you born? 97. Oh, yeah. We well, still had two years. So, yeah, it was it was two years before you were born. But they were still kicking around in 97. They're actually still technically, I'm pretty sure, at least a few years ago around, technically. No, we're going to have to disguise our addresses then because these people are serious. I mean, my name is not Nikki. Uh... <laughs> my name is Brie Literal. Come oh. get me. <laughs> <laughs> wow, two very different approaches there. <laughs> I don't there think they do. They're not into the same stuff because they don't have a uh, good old, uh, I don't even want to call him by his cult name, Rob. I don't think he deserves that because he's kind of like, excuse my French, an ass wipe of a human being. You mean um, Shoko Asahara? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, his name is actually Chizuo Matsumoto, which mm-hmm. is a much less cool name. <laughs> <laughs> so... So anyway, they don't have him anymore, but so you don't think they're they're not sending anthrax in the mail or anything? No, I don't think they do that stuff anymore. Uh just like that other cult that still exists, um, that doesn't do anything. <laughs> Which anymore. one? I can't there think of so the name. Many. It was like a big one that they're still like splinter oh, cells off of the There's they don't so like... many. Oh, children but, of God. Like that. Uh, but they don't or do the unification the gross shit church. anymore. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Really? They don't do the, the weird sex stuff anymore, the children of God? No, no, no. I don't think they do. I think uh, they wouldn't exist if they still did that. Well, <laughs> well the, I mean, the there really was weird this stuff. kind of like sanitation of their history and like their their rules where they like they made new rules. If it's what I'm thinking of, they made new rules and then they sent out in like a secret letter, like a letter that's basically like, uh, JK, just like we can't say we do this anymore. Cool, cool. <sighs> I mean, the sex among consenting adults is fine. It's when the, you know kids got involved that's that's when it yeah, got that's really what they were talking about pretty awful mm. anyway we're not talking about them today <laughs> let's, uh, i let's hope we pl- don't ever talk about them <laughs> let's 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 go ahead and pledge it out and talk about japan we the members, we the members of the of secret order, order of alchemical, of alchemical, alchemical actors, actors do solemnly commit ourselves to a full and honest, honest telling of the history of the, history of the occult, occult as far as, as we as know, we it. know it. it fantastic all right, here we go to Japan. 
And Brie, you, you you know some of these pronunciations, it feels like, yeah? Oh, I do, yeah. A few that's of them. Fa- that's pretty good. A few good. of them. <laughs> that that gives them. me peace. <laughs> well, you can help me out. And if, if neither of us know, then we'll just do the best we can. Yeah. On the 6th of August, 1946, moving back a few decades, the United States, with the consent of the United Kingdom, detonated a nuclear weapon over the Japanese city of Hiroshima. Three days later, they detonated a second nuclear weapon over the city of Nagasaki. The bombings killed between 100,000 and 230,000 civilians and had long-term consequences for public and environmental health for decades afterward. After an extensive bombing campaign in anticipation of the mainland invasion of Japan, the Allies had given the Japanese the opportunity to end the war, but the Japanese would not surrender. And so, on the 15th of August, just six days after the bombing of Nagasaki, the Japanese finally gave up and surrendered to the Allied powers. The day before, the Japanese Emperor Hirohito had broadcast his capitulation announcement over the radio. He said, The enemy has begun to employ a new and most cruel bomb, the power of which to do damage is indeed incalculable, taking the toll of many innocent lives. Should we continue to fight, not only would it result in an ultimate collapse and obliteration of the Japanese nation, but also it would lead to the total extinction of human civilization the invention yeah how about that that's heavy yeah hirohito didn't mess around the invention of the atomic bomb was one of the most significant and cataclysmic scientific and cultural events of the 20th century and arguably human history writ large images of total annihilation loomed in our collective imagination for the first time across the globe but they were particularly vivid for the japanese Visions of doomsday entered Japan's psyche through the direct experience with bombs that leveled whole cities. Another bomb was being prepared for use on the 19th of August, with six more in production for the fall. As Hirohito suggested, the Japanese were facing total destruction in a way no culture or civilization had ever seen before. This was the background for pop culture exports like Godzilla as well as the crop of new religious movements that swept through Japan after the war. During the occupation of Japan following World War II, Shinto was removed as the country's state religion, and Christian missionaries flooded the islands, opening up a new era of religious colonization and exploration. The rise of new religious movements, coupled with Japan's intimate experience of doomsday, formed the background for the Aum Shinrikyo movement. There we go. That's our setup. Any any thoughts on on? <laughs> One of the things that like gets me about this is that if if this all hadn't happened and the emperor wasn't forced to be like, "Sorry, guys, I am not God," he literally had to announce, "I am not God." Right. Everybody was like, "Oh, well, it's time to to get some new religions after all this," and <laughs> that's the whole reason that people like uh. This idiot who is got into power. And there was another group that he actually mirrored his stuff after that was a much more innocent cult. Still a cult, basically. Um, that was formed, too. There was a bunch of these groups. It's really interesting to actually like read into like the more prominent ones that showed up. So from your perspective, the cult leaders in Japan were sort of subbing in for the loss of the Shinto emperor. Yeah, so since there wasn't like the the mandated like the state regulated shinto or whatever it was there's like a terminology for it um being that the emperor is god um it kind of let this gap for a bunch of people to come flooding into and to manipulate people that were looking for something to believe in because they didn't have anything anymore yeah (laughs) yeah i mean historically japan like you know back in ancient times that this was the the tradition that the Mm -hmm. emperor you know that that shinto was the state religion during the shogunate it sort of fell apart like in the medieval period but then they reinstated it Mm -hmm. i believe in the 19th century Mm -hmm. so it actually wasn't that long that shinto was the state religion of japan like when it came back like a hundred years or so i think before world war ii um, so FYI, a little Japanese history there. <laughs> mm-hmm. All right, let's get to uh, Bree's favorite person, the guru. I hope you tell my favorite story about him growing up. 
I probably will, but if I don't, you can feel free to add it. Oh, okay. <laughs> so uh, his cult name was, or cult leader name was Shoko Asahara, uh, but he was born, uh, you said this pretty well, Bri, Chitsuo Matsumoto? Yeah. Um, yeah, that's, you said it the first name better than I could, but yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> I think you're probably more correct than I am. I've heard it as like Chizua. But oh, you might be right. You might be right. I, I like to watch Japanese TV, but it's I often dubbed over. So <laughs> yeah. Oh, see, I only watch the actual like original languages. I don't like dubbing. <laughs> what you with the the subtitles? Yeah, but I usually watch a lot of Korean stuff, so uh, my also familiarity good. with Japanese pronunciation might not be as Korean stuff is wildly violent. Um, but it's but... really good. A lot of it. It can Yeah, it really can be. The movies can be good. Mm-hmm. Anyhow, uh, he was born, <laughs> Matsumoto was born in 1955, blind in one eye with partial sight in the other. His older and younger brother were both fully blind, and his parents sent him to a school for the blind, even though his partial sight would have qualified him for regular school. He was manipulative and bullying as a child. He took advantage of the other children because he was the one who could see. Oh. Yeah, in a school oh, yeah. for the blind, having oh, partial that's sight. Awful. Yeah, that, that that makes you king. Um, it does. <laughs> for good or ill. At school, he received good grades and a black belt in judo, but never managed to win election for class president despite running many times. I love that we have all this information. <laughs> I'm sorry, when you, when you say black belt in judo, all I can imagine is like, but like with his class for the school for the blind. Well, yeah, you'd be, I guess you'd be and right. He's just yeah. like kicking everyone. You don't butt. understand how. <laughs> ridiculous this gets in like the stories of like him being the one person who could kind of see in a school oh my gosh. <laughs> she's just like kicking everyone's butts it's not fair what else do you know about his school days Bri? So, I bet that's about all i have to say well one of my favorite stories has to do with him being like a manipulator and because he was the only one who could like see uh so and this kind of really was able to kickstart his ability to be this this uh, hyper bully manipulating force and he like learned okay this is how far i can push people to get what i want because they rely on me if they rely mm-hmm. on me i i can get what i want out of it and so what he would do is since he was the only one who could who could even see uh the kids would need to go into like a uh, town or whatever to like get stuff and he would offer to walk them walk them into town for like shoes or you know a haircut or whatever and then they would get there, they would do what they needed to do, and the kid would be like, all right, let's go back. And he'd be like, you can pay me, and then we can go back, otherwise I'm going to leave you here. Oh. And so they would be forced to pay him to walk him back. And I think part of the reason he probably never got class president, even though he wanted to be prime minister, fun fact, yes, uh, that's true. was because everybody was afraid of him, <laughs> right? Like, nobody liked the kid. <laughs> like, yeah, you're not going to vote for that guy. Although yeah. sometimes in the United States, we vote for people who are kind of like the class bully, don't we? <laughs> yeah, it's true, but I guess in a school of the blind, when everybody else is being so manipulated and bullied by the one individual who's running, like you're not going to vote for him, right? You're yeah. not going to give him more power. This yeah. guy, he takes your lunch money and he kicks your butt in judo and you can't see him coming. He just sucks all <laughs> if around. If you can't pay him to take you back, he leaves you there. <laughs> like, oh my god. <laughs> my goodness. Mm-hmm. At the age of 20, he became a masseuse, which was a common occupation for the blind in Japan, and an acupuncturist in Kumamoto. Uh, so that, that makes sense. He'd be a masseuse. Mm-hmm. He moved to Tokyo and met and married. So uh, let me just reflect on that for a second. I don't want to pick on blind people, but like, if, if, there are a couple of advantages, right? So theoretically, you know, you don't need to see to be able to give a good massage, but also, you know, like people are naked. I don't think the Jap- I don't know if the Japanese care about that. Uh, the, the, they have the baths, maybe. Like I know yeah. Korea, they have the baths. But see, I always thought about it as like, since it's such like a spiritual culture, I always thought that if you're blind, it kind of puts you in a more sensory place, so like you can feel for things more. That's also why a lot oh, of acupuncturists yeah. are blind there too. Yeah, it what? makes sense. Yeah, that's like a like you're I don't know more in tune to the, your senses, so you understand other people's senses better. I think is uh, the assumption the, uh, through through feel and yeah touch okay. yeah. i mean that still scares me a little, a little that's terrifying i can't imagine somebody putting a bunch of needles in my body while they're blind but 
I mean, if they could see, I wouldn't let them. Same, them. same. But, no, um, I agree with so you, it's Nikki. Like an extra <laughs> I was like, <laughs> I agree. So, so just no acupuncture for this group. No. Mm. Fair enough. Blind or not, we're not. We're not discriminating. Nope. We're saying, no, it's the acupuncture we don't like. It's the needles in the my needles. body for no reason other than to stay there for a few minutes. No. <laughs> Actually, a Chinese practice, so that would have been important. Anyhow, he moved to uh, Tokyo and met and married Tomoko Ishii. Yeah? You feeling all right with that, Brie? Yeah. Uh, with whom he would have six children. In 1981, he joined uh, Gonshu, a new religion founded in 1954 by Seiyu Kiriyama. Agonshu was a form of Buddhism incorporating fire rituals. Kiriyama received a holy relic of the Buddha, the, the leader that is, from the president of Sri Lanka, which helped to spread his fame. And the movement grew to 500,000 members, including the young, soon-to-be founder of Aum Shinrikyo. That's sort of a fun little story, isn't it? Mm-hmm. <laughs> See, guy goes to Sri Lanka, gets this Buddha artifact, and people are like, oh, that's... We want to join that guy. He's got an artifact. Yeah. It's all it takes, Rob. Whatever works. Yeah, we need to get an artifact, don't we? We need an artifact. That's Ooh. what we're missing. Yes. What do you got up there in Canada, Nikki? Any artifacts we can have? Uh, um, Probably not. We, like some old crime scene tape? <laughs> <laughs> That's. Is it a famous crime? Uh... <laughs> No, just but like I, it's just like there's just lots of it around. Just a guy got beat up on your stairwell, and there's just so much crime that we can just oh. snag some tape. I'm not kidding. I just saw someone like on a tree branch, like out on my walk. Just, what like, happened someone, on that like, branch? No, I just people just like the um. The oh, you decorate with it. Police here suck, and they never clean up. Like you can oh. see, there's like gloves, like those like blue plastic or like gloves. Oh mm-hmm. my god! Left and like evidence bags, empty ones left behind, and like caution tape everywhere like police line to not cross stuff they're just really lazy you know you could like cosplay one night though you could have a, have a fun time you could <laughs> you oh my god please get... nikki do not touch any of it <laughs> do not put, put any of that on, on your body <laughs> be like go up go up to your roommate and be like hey let's play crime scene tonight i oh think god. that'd be a good time i get arrested because my dna is left on crime scene tape <laughs> i was touching out in the Oh, no, in my imagination, you have evidence bagged, you have gloves left, you have the whole nine yards. You've collected everything. No. That is my concern. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. I'm coming to Winnipeg. We're playing crime scene. Oh, my God. He, <laughs> you don't play crime scene in Winnipeg. You walk into the wrong area and you're in a crime scene. Oh, yeah. that's, not, that's not as much fun. No. He, uh... <laughs> Someone got shot five times at the end of my street. Are you oh, serious, no. Nikki? Yes. Right outside my parking lot. Like, I could see from my window the crime scene. You got to get out of there, man. You do. That's what my girlfriend says, too. <laughs> Listen to your girlfriend, Nikki. Times are coming. After joining Agonshu, Asahara became increasingly interested in Indian source material and also began studying the writing of Nostradamus, mm-hmm. which is sort of an odd combination, but... Okay, reading the Vedas, reading Nostradamus. Nostradamus had predicted the end of the world at the end of the 20th century, and his work had become increasingly popular with the Japanese converts to new religions. Nostradamus was all over like those weird, like weekly world news kind of scandal sheets when I was growing up. It was all about how Nostradamus was predicting the end of the world through the 80s and the 90s. So I, I, I'm feeling that, feeling that scene well, After, part of this has to do with like a magazine that he used to get nerds into his cult. Yes, he created right. He created his own yeah, zine. He did. Well, I it was the nineties, eighties. Yeah. You create a zine. It was, it was what we did back in the day. I was create not old enough zine. to do that, but yeah, put on your flannel shirt and play your Nirvana and work on your zine. Wow, that's actually if like come full circle. That could just be like something a teenager would be up to today. That could just be anybody, you know. Yeah. Yeah, but they'd be doing like a blog or something, but it's about the same idea. Or a podcast. Podcast. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so anyway, uh, Nostradamus predicted the end of the world, end of the 20th century. Japanese are getting all, all interested in that. So Asahara opened a Chinese herbal medicine shop, uh, and he was arrested in 1982 for selling fake Chinese herbal medicine. Mm-hmm. And then, I don't know how you even do that. And then he went on to open a yoga school. And then in 84, he founded Aum Shinsen no Kai. 
Does that sound right, Bree? That sounds would, pretty. It, it translates pretty to the Ohm circle of divine hermits. Yeah. Ah, I love that. Yeah. Wait till you hear what Ohm Shinrikyo is. <laughs> He rose to fame in, in 85 when the popular New Age magazine Twilight Zone published a photograph That's of him is. levitating. Oh my yeah, gosh. Yeah, levitating, quote unquote. Oh my gosh. <laughs> well done. Oh. What? Wait, what? What? I feel like I've, sorry, I just feel like I've seen that photo before. It's nothing that dramatic. You very really? well could have. It's a really yeah. famous photo. Hmm. Yeah. That year, wandering on the shores of a northern of northern Japan, a god appeared to him. A god, and remember Shinto. There are a variety of uh, uh, oh, what are they called? This is going to kill me. Um, kimi. Oh, why did I go to Hinduism? I know. <laughs> it's kami. There are a variety of yes. kami. There yeah. it is. A variety of kami. So could be anybody. A god appeared to him and ordained him the god of light who leads armies of the gods, which is feels more Hindu. Well, that's the thing, is that literally he says, screw this, and then uses Hindu with a mix of Judeo-Christian it, later on in his cult for his, his beliefs in uh, Huramageddon. Yeah, there's not a whole lot of, of J- Japanese culture in it. No, ultimately. not at all. It, Japanese it's all religion about Shiva and anyway. the end yeah. of days. <laughs> So he went on to label the god Shiva, uh, this god who who had, who had approached him on on the beach. <laughs> so okay, <laughs> she, I know um, I know this already, but it just sounds ridiculous hearing you say it wrong. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> I have that power. Um, in 1986, he achieved his final enlightenment after four or five days of meditation in the Himalayas, which are sacred to the Indians. Uh, so a lot of this is is very Hindu in flavor. <clears throat> All right, so let's get to uh, the religion. You ready for the vol- religion, Nikki? What they believe? Oh, probably not. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't think any of you are ready for this. <laughs> Saddle up with within Aum Shinrikyo. He came to be called Sonshi or revered master, and he took mistresses from a- among Aum members while preaching celibacy for pretty much everybody else. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Wow, That's shocking, how it goes. revolutionary, never been done by a cult before. Yeah, it's very Indian, there's a lot of Indian gurus, right? There's a number of, yeah, anyhow, uh, sounds like Nexium, yeah, all this sort That's of like stuff. like any cult. It's any cult. <laughs> Not our cult, Nikki, I-, I let you guys have sex with whoever you want. <laughs> Thank you, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we appreciate it. You're welcome. Anyhow, it's not my business. <laughs> In fact, I encourage it. Okay, so he his... <laughs> His advanced spiritual ability allowed him to partake in any manner of not practicing what he preached yeah. <laughs> that he wanted to. So he's just like, because I'm so ascended, I don't need to you know, do all this other stuff I'm telling you guys to do. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Aum involved both casual pra- participants and far more serious shuke or renunciates. Is that right, Bray Shuke? Yeah, I think so. In 1989, there were about 200 renunciants. So uh, you got that, Nikki? So there's, there's like all these random people in it. Like thousands of people are members of Aum Shinrikyo, but then very special ones. He's, they, they, he drafts them or they volunteer to be renunciates. I think generally he's going to like, somebody's going to come up to you and say, we want you to join the inner circle. Oh, okay. I was going to yeah. say that's like his like inner group. But mind you, to get in in the first place, you have to pay like a fee. And there's different fees you can pay to get different levels from the get go. Of course. And if you pay, I think it's like $2,000, not only do you get to be like super close to his inner circle, but you get like, I forget what the amount is, but like a, free a bunch t-shirt? of- No, no, it's, it's <laughs> even better than that, Nikki. No, it's it's much better. Speaking um, of which, have I sent you a t-shirt, Nikki? Yes. Oh, good. All right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but Nikki, wouldn't you much rather have, I think it's, I forget what the amount is, um, but- uh, a specific amount of Rob's dirty bath water. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> yes. Because Dang, that's, that's what you can but, get um... from Shoko Asahara <laughs> if you like pay $2,000. bath water. She just took it from history. I would only send you clean bath water that I was planning on bathing in. <laughs> For $2,000. <Just> <laughs> about there. So... 
<laughs> That's just one of them. That's just Oh my gosh. So but but being a renunciant was not just a matter of like like Bree saying it, it did involve giving all of your stuff to him, but um it was like a it was a different lifestyle than the rest of the oh, the, yeah. the cult that they were hardcore uh members so by 1989 uh there were 200 renunciants that grew to a couple thousand by the height of the movement's popularity so the word shuke means leaving home and it involved members giving all their worldly possessions to the organization as we're saying and engaging in severe asceticism including celibacy long meditations, breathing exercises, intense prostrations, work assignments, and severely reduced sleep. And food what was, consumption. What was that? What, prostrations? So, it, so that's, um, you know, uh, like you, you, uh, you bow down. Mm-hmm. You would do that oh. intensely. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I guess you just lay there for a long period of time, or I don't know, maybe you do it a whole bunch. I think this is the group of people that also um, basically, like, once a day got to eat a bowl of, like, vegetable broth. And that That's was their it. meal. It's a little like the Hindu ascetics or the self-flagellators, the Catholic self-flagellators. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So uh, they became beyond the reach of the world they occupied as the person they were before. That was the point of it. Uh, They would leave no trace for friends and family to contact them. They participated in medicated psychotropic initiations. (laughs) (laughs) What? Involving LSD? What's the funny part of this? Narcotics and barbiturates. Because... Because they're starving? Is that well, why? It's funny to me because, like, a lot of the times, it's not funny. This is not funny. This is actually probably <laughs> really scary. But a lot of the times, it'd be like you're sitting down with for a cup of tea with the dude, and it's just like oh, you start tripping in. because you don't know that you have taken LSD or whatever other med, like uh, yeah, psychot- uh, uh, not psychotics, psychedelics. And he's just like, no, nah, no, nah, it's cool. Your master is here to guide you. Like it's uh, fucked up. Mm. Oh, sorry. Can I say that? <laughs> Yeah, your sister says it all the time. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> if they fell short and sinned in the eyes of the organization and the guru, they could be subjected to harsh immersions in hot or cold water, hanging by the feet for hours, or solitary confinement for days. If you guys piss me off, I'd just make you listen to me talk for a little while. Which is delightful. It's honestly not a punishment, Rob. <laughs> See? Can't punish Bree. Uh- <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty much how i punish my kid she's bad and i like bring her to like a corner and i just stand there with her and she like has to discuss with me what whatever's on my mind oh. well yeah you know, <laughs> or what you want to talk about what i feel like at that mm-hmm. moment yeah at the core of the organization were individuals who embraced uh vajrayana or the diamond vehicle path within tantric buddhism which we talked about in our Tantra episode, certain variants of Vajrayana uh, and the path embraced by Asahara involved attempting to visualize the self as the deity, uh, also a kind of erasure of the ego. So you tried to sort of like become God in your mind or a God. In Aum Shinrikyo, this meant a transformation of the initiate into the guru through in part listening to the sound of Asahara's brainwaves through headphones, drinking his blood, which was supposed to have unique DNA, and then, of course, the bathwater thing. So, yeah, you wanted to become, you wanted to be him. Which sometimes meant consuming parts of him yeah. that you don't want to ever consume from anybody, no, no, I no. hope. Ah. Uh. Yeah, so that that's that's your that's the so that's the diamond vehicle. The sort of how he took the diamond vehicle idea and ported it over to his situation. Made it gross. Yeah, because you're not trying to become, you know, Vishnu or Kali or anything. Now you're trying to become this man. Just this, this asshole. This trying guy. To be good old. <laughs> this dude. Shizuwa <Chizua> Matsumoto. <laughs> <laughs> right. This. Over here. These scientists also. Oh, sorry. What was I talking about? Um, so it was sci- his scientists. He had scientists working for him who were in the cult. And they were the ones who were developing the technology to do this stuff, to, to have the brainwaves and stuff. It, so they, they record his brainwaves and then you would listen to them. And they developed an astral teleporter which translated the guru's mantras into electrical signals 
and they would go on to create the weapons and counterweapons used in Aum Shinrikyo's murderous attacks. So the scientists of Aum Shinrikyo are extremely important, big figures in this story. And we've just met them because they created these weird headphones, but they're going to do much worse stuff. <laughs> and, you know, I, I don't want to pick on scientists because some of my very good friends are scientists, but science does not make you immune to believing bullshit. <laughs> no, not at all. Being super good at science does not prevent you from being drafted into a cult. Oh no. So, or into doing a bunch oh, of no. horrible things that could be considered war crimes that started this in the first place. Oh yeah, the scientists are probably <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> short of uh, uh, you know Asahara himself. Yes. The scientists are probably the worst of the bunch. Because I mean, they created what this turn, oh. and they knew what they were doing. It's not like they Einstein, did. whose you know theory of relativity just incidentally was used with by to create the atomic bomb. These guys <laughs> intentionally. Were developing weapons that they knew he, he was going to use against regular they, people. Exactly. So, core well, members were organized into a series of ministries and agencies designed to serve as the replacement for the Japanese government after Doomsday arrived and wiped civilization away. So, he created his own little government, all these little bureaucracies. Hmm. So, he's, he's big time. He's got a lot of people underneath of him at this point. It's going well. Aum Shinrikyo spent about $700,000 on renting airtime from a Russian radio station, which was then broadcast to Japan and leased Russian television time to make videos for recruiting back home. Japan and Russia are close to each other. For those of you who do not know, they basically border each other. Mm -hmm. Oh, I did not know that. Yeah, yep. There, there's some disputed territory. Uh, there can be disputed territory between Japan and Russia. It was the plot of the latest oh. James Bond. The more you know. I didn't know the James Bond part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. Daniel Craig's last last uh, movie, which as James Bond, there, there was a little island that uh, Rami Malek lived on that was in disputed territory between Japan and Russia. <laughs> All right. <laughs> but historically, the Russians and the Japanese have had wars with each other. So mm -hmm. anyhow. Uh, in summer 1994, they performed a live musical at their Battle Cry Cultural Festival about the group's achievements and plans. Oh my gosh, when are we going to make our musical based on <laughs> Uncle Confession's achievements and plans? It sort of makes me think of Jill Ray, who staged that elaborate Joan of Arc oh musical. Remember that? <laughs> You're not wrong. Yeah, it, it, that was oh the first God. thing that came to mind is this... Yeah, he's this crazy guy putting all his money into this bizarre Battle Cry <laughs> cultural festival. Although many of the organization's members were middle-aged, Asahara appealed to more college students and young graduates than most other Japanese new religious movements. These people were, much like participants in the New Age in the U.S., drawn to alternative religion at the margins of the mainstream. Aum Shinrikyo also had a particular appeal for doctors scientists, and engineers. Since Asahara often couched his claims in scientific terms, he knew how to pull them in. He was brilliant at math, too. Like, this kid, when he was a kid, like, I don't... If he hadn't been so set on being a manipulative piece of crap and wanting to be the prime minister, <laughs> he could have been a brilliant, like, mathematician. He could have done anything. Like, it's insane how smart this guy is. This just proves my point that you should never trust someone who is too good at math. Because math <laughs> doesn't make sense. <laughs> I, I mean, yes. I mean, I, I think as we go through this, this whole series on dangerous cults, uh, Brie, I think we're often going to have this feeling of, oh, man, if only that guy would have just done something productive with his time, he could have really done something cool. But instead, this. Well, you can say the same thing of Jims Jones, but he did do something productive with his time. He was right. a civil rights advocate, and then right. look what happened to him. <laughs> yeah. Like, he was doing really good stuff, and then he no, said, hmm, methamphetamines much? Yeah, I think yeah. I'd rather do meth. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. the old ego. So, uh, they also, by the way, recruited young teenagers who quickly vanished into the ranks of the renunciates, which did not make their parents extremely happy. No. Rob, have you seen the anime that they made? 
No, I have not. Oh, yeah. One of their advertisement the campaigns was an anime. That's why they're known as the anime cult. I think you can oh. still find it on YouTube. Yeah, no, I have to find that. Yes. We'll have to check that out. Uh, I think it still exists because I remember when I was writing your paper, I actually found it and I watched it. It was weird. Wild. It is weird. Be careful when you're uh, searching Aum Shinrikyo commercial because you may end up on a watch list, but listeners, please enjoy. <laughs> that's that's true. <laughs> <laughs> you might, but at least you're on one for the right reasons. Right, yeah, for occult confessions. So <laughs> you did it you did it for <laughs> For the movement. So the organization amassed vast stores of money through renunciates, donations. Remember, these people are giving all their stuff to the cult, but also through the sale of religious objects meant to bring the initiate closer to the guru. So that you could also, you know, buy the bathwater. To rent the headset with his brainwaves for a month or drink his blood cost $10,000, translating it from yen. The organization also sold computers, weird, and undercut okay. competitors. <laughs> okay. They had a bunch of computer nerds in the cult, like computer <laughs> nerds, gaming nerds, anime nerds. All those people were there. They're all and smart. It's, <laughs> it's the 90s. So, yeah. you know, selling these big desktop computers was a thing. Like, that was a job mm -hmm. that you could do. You didn't have to be one of them guys at Best Buy. You could just, you know, you could just do that from your house. Uh, but here's the thing, Nikki. They undercut their competitors since renunciate labor kept costs low because renunciates weren't getting paid. They only got paid apparently in in uh, you know vegetable broth. So <laughs> yeah, can't compete. They ran noodle shops and restaurants, a fitness club, child care service, dating service, and travel agencies. I love the dating service. All of the things they can't do. <laughs> well, they did yeah. them, and they made they, a ton of money, Nikki. You no, know, but I mean, like, they can't travel, like, away from their cult if they're, like, you know what I mean? Like, they can't. Right? Oh, they, the things that they, they can't, personally they can't, can't do. Date. They can't have sex. They can't no have children. Sex, like, they can't, you know what I mean? Can't so, eat like, noodles. Yeah. <laughs> right? They're doing all They this can't stuff. eat noodles. Right. No, they just I get just put that broth. together, Rob, and I don't know why. <laughs> they're running they noodle shops. A, they work at a noodle shop, and they just get the bone broth. They get right. the broth. That's it. I bet they could they could do fitness though. The fitness club. I bet that's cool. Oh, they, they can... all have to be able to do yoga so they can. Yeah. Oh wait, no, they can't. Only only uh, uh, Asahara can be the one to propel his ass into the air so he looks like he's <laughs> levitating. <laughs> no, ah! no levitating, but they can totally bend around. They can they can be real flexible. <laughs> Aum Shinrikyo's headquarters was in Fujinomaya, near Mount Fuji. Yeah? Does that sound right, Brie? Yeah. There were 20 additional facilities around to uh, Tokyo, Yokohama, and urban areas around Honshu. They had a three-story facility for developing chemical and biological weapons. Three stories. Oh, no. It's a lot of... It's it's a, a lot, lot of sarin. It's a lot of money. Like, yeah. This is a big... This is like a corporation. You know, like a big corporation. Sarin was ultimately made in one of these buildings. Uh, they also had additional labs for working with botulins and anthrax. Botulinus, sorry. Mm -hmm. So biological weapons and chemical weapons. There was a place for manufacturing Russian AK-47s. Real specific. <laughs> uh, that one. Well, I mean, it's handy. You buy the parts from Russia and put them together. And yeah. uh, the Astral Hospital Institute for Medical Care. What? It was also used for drugging and murdering apostate members and their en and, and enemies of the cult. Yes, Nikki, so. mm, that sounds more like that there than a go, hospital. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, it's that an astral sense. hospital for your astrals. That sounds like you're going to walk in there and they're going to kill you immediately <laughs> and then try to tend to your astral spirit. <laughs> yeah, you might get an enema first at the <sighs> hospital. Patients who were non-followers would be pressured to make donations in order to cure their illness on the premise that giving precipitated healing. Doctors would also remove fingerprints and alter facial features to prevent the police from apprehending members. Some members also died as a result of the rigors of being a renunciate, and this would often happen in these their own medical facilities. Likely, Ayum Shinrikyo's first death happened this way, and they resorted to murder when one of the victim's friends, a person named Shuji Taguchi, threatened to leave the group. The group was particularly sensitive to bad publicity right then because they were about to receive official recognition as a religion from the Japanese government, and the organization killed lawyers who targeted them in court. They killed apostate members, and eventually they just killed complete strangers, which is how we started the episode. 
On the 23rd of April 1995, Hideo Mirai, the scientist most responsible for developing the weapons involved in the sarin attack, was knifed to death on the steps of Aum Shinrikyo's Tokyo headquarters by a hitman from the Yakuza, a hit that was likely ordered by the guru himself, or perhaps one of his lieutenants, because Mirai, while incredibly loyal, had been talking to the press too much following the sarin gas attacks. The total list of individuals the group murdered numbered around 80. Do you have a different number, Brie, or does that sound okay? Um, I think 80 sounds correct just because they weren't fully successful with their actual thing. Yeah, and we're leaving off the gas attacks, right? Yeah, so, so I think 80 sounds about right. Yeah. That's crazy, though. It's definitely I'm... not less than 80. <laughs> that, that's organized crime. Yeah, they're basically an organized crime group like they're not even a cult really at this point <laughs> they're like bordering on yeah, to organized crime in a terrorist group say, they are a terrorist group uh, yeah but i was also gonna say i don't know maybe this is too controversial it sounds a little uh a little american government-y you know, people die in out of the blue you speak out you get killed you speak out you that's a very canadian you. sentiment but i understand where you're coming from <laughs> yeah no nikki <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So you're I'm thinking about saying, like the CIA? Uh, it's just whenever there's people in power, and they they almost always do really bad stuff. Um, and they would rather kill anyone who got in their way than face up to that really bad stuff. And I feel like that's a villain trope that's like actually scarily accurate. I think that's fair. Yeah, I think it's fair too, especially with the idea of hiring this man to make your weapons and then killing the man because you don't want him to say that you made the weapons. Exactly. Yeah. Well, I've, I've I've been I've made the point on the show that when you talk about presidential power, I mean these are people who directly or indirectly kill people. They order mm -hmm. drone strikes mm -hmm. and you know mm -hmm. civilians and all that sort of stuff, and it's just a nature of the work that this is what they do. But it's it's pretty troubling. Yeah. The religious doctrine for murder centered on poa. Poa generally meant disciplined meditation in the presence of a guru, but it took on a darker meaning for Aum Shinrikyo, becoming an act of homicide at the guru's request. Poa essentially meant taking an individual's bad karma onto oneself by killing them. But that's a lose-lose situation. Why would you want to do that? Because you, Nikki, if you're a good member, have the spiritual strength to take it on. Yep. Why wouldn't I just let that person live with their no, bad karma? No, no, Nikki. No. Because <laughs> you're you're being a spiritual warrior. And you're mm -hmm. helping them out. You gotta fight that otherworldly fight. The oh, well, when you put it that way. Yeah. Be, 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 a, be a trooper. The guru took bad <laughs> karma onto himself when he ordered a killing, as did the assassin in many cases. Sometimes when the guru requested a killing or the development of some bizarre weapon or counterweapon, disciples would rationalize it as a mahamudra or guru challenge. He's just, he's just challenging us to create a deadly weapon that will kill thousands. He's not going to do it. No, it's just a, he's challenging our soul. <laughs> believe, believe, like when I send you guys bathwater that I haven't used yet yeah. you don't know what to do with it I, I just send it to you without any notes there's no instructions it's up to us to spiritually find what we so, need to do with it with that <laughs> unused potential bathwater believers approached murder with a sacred carefree mind attempting to kill but not caring if they were killed in the process as the date of the Tokyo subway attacks drew closer, Asahara began to preach about the accumulation of bad karma among the general population. He warned that if members did not protect Aum Shinrikyo against persecutors at all costs, they risked having the truth revealed by Asahara purged from the earth. So that's the other thing. It's, it's got this millenarian uh, Armageddon feel to it. We have to preserve the teachings. If we don't preserve the teachings by, you know, killing our enemies, then... It's on us. Well, and culturally, with the whole like loss of a empire and um, emperor, there we go. Not empire. Well, empire <laughs> emperor. too, equally um, so. 
you know, that set the the tone for everybody to be like, well, now we have this if you're in it and you're like, now I have this. I don't want to lose this. Yeah. There's a desperation there. I just mm-hmm. I there's a point where I don't know cuz you know there's like there's a point with every cult leader where they either believe too hard in what they're doing and they get lost or they just throw away what they've been preaching to everybody whether they believe it or not and I don't know where the point is for him where the Harumi Gidden just kind of like gets thrown out and it's just kind of like a we have to we just have to trigger everybody dying like we it's on us to take everybody's karma quote unquote it's just well, him trying to be a controlling ass I let's see if we can find that point Bri uh, let's talk about the attack itself <sighs> Aum Shinrikyo's Armageddon was a blend of eastern and western sources as Bri was talking about Nostradamus and the revelations of Saint John were joined to Hindu and Buddhist end times predictions like the description of the Kali Yuga the last eon or epic in uh, hindu culture asahara also added a dash of japanese popular culture namely the animated television show the voyage of the space battleship uh, yamato which which (sighs) (laughs) sorry this you have to laugh but it it is it's all very dark it was about yeah it's what <laughs> go ahead it's just so absurd that's why i laugh but sometimes when i yes. say these things because yes. it's just such an absurd concept i just i can't comprehend how it got so dark we like, do you know? not we're not making light this is a horrible thing that happened but it is so ridiculous yeah anyhow about a post nuclear so this was a tv show it was an animated tv show saturday morning cartoon about a post nuclear holocaust world and a brave crew of astronauts who ventures out to recover a cosmo cleaner that will mitigate earth's nuclear pollution so they're going out into space to bring back this cosmic vacuum so this is part of his theory that this is you can that this exists and then there was a bit of Western conspiracy theory with the Jews of the Freemasons, just for good measure, working toward their own apocalypse in contrast to Asahara's apocalypse, which was somehow the better of the two apocalypses. So he had to get to his apocalypse before those Jews and Freemasons pulled off theirs over in America oh and Canada. My goodness. <sighs> Asahara was paranoid about counterattacks and kept a device developed by his team of scientists for countering chemical and biological attacks in his family's apartment. He believed that the United States government, the Japanese gov- government, rival religious groups like uh, Soka Gakkai and the Crown Princess Masako could all potentially be out to get him. <laughs> the t- I would believe that, honestly, you wouldn't even have to know this guy to not like him. Uh, I believe he has a very long list of enemies. He probably should be paranoid. Why stop at the Crown Princess? Yeah, there's, what about the Crown Prince? What about... Yeah. <laughs> so many people. What did you do to the crown princess? Right? Who knows? Do you know, Brie? Why why the crown princess? You have any idea? You know, that wasn't the point of my paper, Rob, so I don't I know. know. <laughs> <laughs> Such a uh, bizarre a new detail. paper concept, Brie. I need you to find why, why he thought she would be mad at him. Well, I think he just was at the point where every cult leader gets really crazed and they think really random seemingly high-powered people are out to get them jim jones did the same thing i think they all just do yeah the tokyo subway attack was not their first attempt to deploy biological and chemical weapons in japan asahara fantasized about a variety of weapons of mass destruction building on nikolai tesla's unrealized vision of conveying electrical currents through the ground asahara talked to his scientists about discovering a way to create and transmit a 10 trillion volt charge you know if this hadn't happened decades before we started this show i would be a little i'd be sweating a little bit like that i accidentally inspired this person because so many of our topics are in his stuff oh yeah tesla india he's just drawing from all these sources he's he's very occult i guess in that way yeah he's one of those guys that just pulls things that sound good from things that exist i was gonna say it's also just like whatever fits his agenda he's like i'll take that and i'll take that that sounds like something i like thank you i can use that against people thank you it's the conspiracy theorist and the you know the apocalyptic you know that's always going hand in hand Mm -hmm. asahara was also interested in developing a plasma uh and a laser gun oh 
in 19, which is tangentially related to Tesla's research. Iom's and Drinkio uh, members broke into two laser laboratories in Japan and purchased a half million dollar laser system from a company in California. Oh, wow. Just sold it to him. No biggie. Members met in Moscow. Come on, California. Members met in Moscow with Nobel winner Nikolai Basov, whose research focused on lasers. So, I mean, these were serious guys. Yeah. They could get a Nobel Prize winner to sit down and have tea with them. Uh, freaking I'm, Keith Raniere met the, met uh, the Dalai Lama, the Nexium guy. Uh, uh, these people, they're money. Co- con men. Money. They're high level con men. And you're right. Yeah, they they collect a lot of money, Nikki. And then they're just good at talking themselves into these bizarre places. I mean, right, Brie? I mean, isn't that what's happening with the that's with, basically like a Nobel how Prize it goes. winner? And I, I feel like hold on, a second. I feel like. I, <laughs> Um, I think that he might have also met the Dalai Lama, actually. Really? Well, I mean, it would have been handy, I suppose. Are you yeah, Googling um, it? Yeah, I'm pretty sure he did. He met the Dalai Lama? Yep, he met the Dalai Lama. Uh, when could, when do we get to meet the Dalai Lama? I was going to say, if you looked up a list of celebrities, though, who have met the Dalai Lama... Yeah, he's he's gets he gets around that Dalai Lama. It's probably a lot, and like that's why I'm like it's money. We need to get on this Dalai Lama thing. Uh, we just need to have need a, a lot more a money. billion dollar compound, I guess. Yeah. Oh, but we, we, we'll get there one patron at a time. Patrons, it's up to you. <laughs> Please support us on Patreon so we can find our own cult compound. Help us build our compound, and then we can meet the Dalai Lama. Yes. <laughs> The Naked Truth and the Metallurgic Prophet and the Supreme Hierophant sit down with the Dalai Lama. What a time. What a day that will be. Okay. So, when we're talking about a plasma gun, Asahara means microwave radiation, which he hoped to be able to use to irradiate or juice people without irradiating property. This comes back to Hiroshima. What he wanted to do was create a kind of nuclear holocaust without all the residual fallout and poisoning so that he could just take over the space. Oh, he didn't want to have to live in the mess he made. No, he wanted to be greedy about it. Just kill the people, and which is also kind of the plot of the latest James Bond movie. He predicted that... <laughs> sorry. <laughs> He predicted that the United States would strike Japan with atomic and hydrogen bombs in 1996, and World War III would commence a decade later in 2006. Japan would suffer horribly at the hands of the United States in the coming war as a way to cleanse its karma for the future. In Australia, Oum Shinrikyo purchased a large sheep ranch where they... (laughs) So ridiculous. Where they sought uranium deposits to construct a nuclear warhead. There are currently three functioning uranium mines in Australia, just so you know, where the government is concerned about too much mining, uh, compromising groundwater. West Australia is home to a series of near-surface uranium deposits, some as close as 15 meters to the surface. And I want to thank our Discord listeners for that information. That's insane. An Aum Shinrikyo team did succeed in pulling small amounts of uranium from the rock and set up a laboratory, but Australian authorities became suspicious, prompting the organization to shut down the operation and sell the land. Yeah. I. The more that I hear about this and the more I like rehear and, you know, relearn stuff, the more that I remember that if he hadn't gotten so greedy... These guys could have been successful. Oh yeah, they could have built everything a everything that they wanted to do. Yeah, if they were a little bit smarter, they could have got. I mean, they they had the right ideas, but they were just. I think you're right. He's the ego. He is so smart, and then the ego gets him. Mm-hmm. So he yep. gets it all the time, and he puts a hard date on something, and it's just. Yeah, that hard date. It's every time. The every su- time they put a hard date on something. If we had said, you know, the podcast is going to have 10,000 listeners by, you know, year two or we're going to quit, well, then we wouldn't be here. You know what I mean? Yeah. We may have actually at that point, but anyhow, it, it, you can't do that. You got to play the long game. You got to yeah. play the long game when you're trying to well, destroy like, the world. Well, with cults too, like they'll say this date is the end of the world and then it comes and goes and you're inevitably inevitably going to lose a few followers even. Right. Well, that's why Jim Jones was so smart is because... Oh, he didn't he have didn't, Yeah, he didn't. He didn't do that. He was smart no. about it, but then the meth got to him, so. God dang it. Always the meth. <laughs> they attempted to or release... that cult just like... Oh my gosh. No, I'm, nothing is ever... 
been so upsetting it's, than like what I learned what happened anyway. Oh, with Jim true. Jones? Jim Jones yeah. is, is one of the biggest tragedies that's ever Am I not? In terms of a cult. Am we, are we not killing thousands of people in Japan right now? What's what is that? I don't know. <laughs> what more can I do for you? Well, that was like a few hundred people. <sighs> All right, I'm going con- yeah. to continue with the list of horrible things I, these, <laughs> this guy did. I just think the circumstances are what changed the mood of them. A bit. All right, pretend- I understand. He, he, you know, the, there was a good intention somewhere unlike this guy who just like wanted he seems like he just always wanted to kill people like he he got into a school where everyone was blind and he was like you know it would be easy murder so you guys are into the tragic hero of jim jones as it's opposed not to... even the tragic hero thing with the jim jones thing it's just like tragic anti-hero it, it feels like it was so there was so much heart in it whereas with Om Shinrikyo, it, it it feels so much more uh, institutional and and methodical Capitalistic. and uh, more terroristy. I, I it doesn't it. feel yeah. as like a, a heartfelt group got rotted from the inside and were yeah. murdered and committed suicide all at once and forced yeah. to commit suicide. Like it just it doesn't. It just rings like a different type, pulls a different string of the heart. I guess is what. Yeah, absolutely. Gotcha. It still sucks either way, but. Speaking of which, they attempted to release botulinus toxin from trucks in the middle of the city near American mm. naval insta- installations and at the Narita airport, but the toxin failed to produce any results. They tried to spray botulinus again in 1993 in the neighborhood of Prince Naruhito's wedding. Their failures with maybe that's why the crown princess was annoyed with them. <laughs> Their failures with botulinus came back to the fact that they failed to isolate and then weaponize a strain of the toxin. So they just put it randomly. (laughs) They just randomly put it out there? Yeah, their biologists were not fantastic. In 92, Asahara traveled with some followers to Africa during the Ebola outbreak to help, they said, but they were suspicious, uh, or there were suspicions, I should say, that they were attempting to collect Ebola samples to bring home and weaponize. I am not surprised. Yeah. Yeah. Horrible. They began producing sarin in 93 and in 94 using information gathered from their contacts in Russia as well as manuals available in the United States in 1993. Yeah, we got freedom. I feel like uh, never in an episode have I made so many just like uh, I, noises well, before. <laughs> the US does. We got this whole freedom thing when oh, it Rob, comes do you to... Have, um, any insight as to like i know there was a lot of modes uh, uh that they tried to do their their mass his mass killing in but uh, do you know why they were so like they were real set on biological warfare was it just availability to it yeah they sarin ended up being the way they went which was chemical yeah and they were still, open to nuclear like, it it was easier i think it's you i think you you've got the right idea Bree. the man was in a rush okay so nuclear war, he could have probably maybe worked around to, but there's a lot of opportunity for failure, and it takes a lot of time to build a warhead. Just ask the Iranians. Yeah. So, you know, but chemical and biological weapons are just easier to produce. So he was just impatient and chose the easier option. I think so. Well, he was rushing against Nostradamus. I mean, it was 1994, was. 95, 96. We're running out of years before... He, he put that hard line because he said, ah, oh, yes, Nostradamus said a man from the East will come. That is me. Yep. In 93, they attempted to assassinate Daisaku Ikeda, leader of the rival religious organization Soka Gakkai. They were scared off on the first attempt and on the second crashed the radio-controlled helicopter drone involved in the attack. In 94, the attorney Taro Takimoto, who was assisting Aum victims in court, suffered symptoms of nerve, nerve agent exposure when Aum members <sighs> released Siren into the ventilator system and onto the windshield of his car while oh it sat God. outside the Kofu My district. God. Yep. Just sitting outside of a courthouse, they did this. That summer, they attacked three judges presiding over a fraud case involving the organization. They released the gas in Matsumoto using a van equipped with a heating pot to vaporize sarin and a fan. The three judges uh, were hearing the case, uh, a case that had been brought against uh, Aum Shinrikyo. The judges, as well as uh, several hundred people, were sickened and seven people died. So already these sort of like innocent people are getting Ugh. caught up in it well we're not we're, we haven't gotten to the subway yet and they're, they're 
These are just their experiments. I mean, they're targeted experiments, but still. They're testing. Yeah, yeah. That's how terrorist groups do it. In the fall, they released Fos- uh, Fos- gene gas, the mail slot of a journalist. That journalist had accused them of, of kidnapping and murdered uh, 20 dissidents using a nerve agent called VX. So they did that as well. Oh. People who quit, that is to say. Uh, 90, the 95 attack was in response to increasing police pressure on the organization. Aum um, Shinrikyo had learned of impending police raids on their facilities, and they were hoping to use the attack to create a diversion, presumably by blaming some other group for the sarin. Had they gotten away with the subway attack, they would have followed it up in November with a second release of sarin involving an MI-17 helicopter they had purchased from the Russians. This has a bit of a Manson feel to it. We're going to kill these guys while those guys are in jail. And then they'll think that they did it yeah. because we couldn't have. And Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but just on a much larger Yo. scale. And a much oh, more yeah, thought he- out scale. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. With far more resources. Mm-hmm. So o- only in, in broad outline is it Mancini. Although the helicopter was never realized, March did not mark the end of Aum Shinrikyo's campaign of terror on Tokyo subways. In May, two vinyl bags were discovered in the men's bathroom in Shinjuku subway station. One was on fire, and the pair contained ingredients to produce hydrogen cyanide. So the idea was that mm. If you got both of them to catch fire, that the co- chemicals would combine, and then it, you know we'd have the chemical reaction for the the, the weapon. So yeah. they're in two separate bags. The ingredients. In July, two pink bags were found in the women's bathroom of the Kayabacho station, again containing the ingredients, which, when combined, <laughs> no, I'm sorry, it's not funny. It's just that, like, because it's in the girls' bathroom, they put them in pink bags. Oh yeah, they didn't want it to anybody to catch on. <laughs> Yeah, because that's going to make them not notice two bags it's just such full a, like, of specific... chemical compounds. <laughs> it's the change of color. Oh, I'm sorry. This is different. A lady did this this time. <laughs> I get it, Nikki. I... <laughs> this must be the women's room. It's um, just, this is so absurd and horrible, but absurd. But... So again, with the combination, we would have gotten a deadly weapon. On the 20th of March, 1998, the third anniversary of the Sarin incident, authorities discovered three beer cans in a bathroom of the Kasu Migaseki station containing a chlorine-like liquid. So uh, that's three years after the attack. I mean, the attack certainly you know, brought down this huge organization, but... There were sort of like these little guerrilla splinters that persisted well past the time of the sarin gas attack. And, and you're saying, Brie, that they're still out there. There are some members. I think there's still like some sort of grouping of them, but I think it's more like the his like original teachings when it comes to like the the trying to mimic Hindu weird practices and meditation and yoga and stuff. Like I think it's like that type of thing. I could be wrong though. I don't know. Yeah, it sounds about right. In many ways, Aum Shinrikyo represents the toxic end of an ascetic, world-renouncing spiritual path, the dissolution of the ego into another, and the destruction of the world in the name of spiritual enlightenment. Tradition holds that the Buddha attempted an ascetic path himself, but discovered that it was too extreme and not the way to accomplish enlightenment. Only after he had nourished himself and gotten back his health was he able to sit and meditate for forty days and forty nights under the Bodhi tree and discover the truth. The Buddha, like all great religious teachers, emphasized compassion as an essential aspect of a spiritual path. While he warned against attachment, he advised that we treat others well and tend to their physical and spiritual needs as far as we are able. In the West, we often worry over religious teachers and churches who claim to follow Jesus' example but are not compassionate. This hypocrisy may seem like a Western phenomenon, but Aum Shinrikyo shows the extent to which all prophets and religious leaders are subject to such egregious misinterpretation that it turns their teaching upside down. Final thoughts? I hate this man. Like, he's probably... I know that I I am fascinated by uh, what happened, but only in the light that may we uh, learn from this and not repeat things like this. Same with any of these guys. Mm -hmm. But this guy, he's like a different breed of them, where he was just so smart, and out of all of the cults that I have ever researched or looked into, he is the only one that I think genuinely could have been successful in a very nefarious way. Like, 
he had the refund the refunds the resources <laughs> the uh, <clears throat> the smarts the people the money the money he had and all... the power the position of power is that's definitely yeah the really scary thing about it is because like lots of cults they have um power over a niche group of people right yeah and it, they usually try to like isolate themselves f- away from the world but he made a humongous corporation of people in society whose sole purpose is to find ways to destroy it and and he personally didn't get attached to anything which i think is a real staple for being successful in a cult is that he did not form any attachments that were more than superficial like with having you know sex with some of his followers or whatever um and he didn't he wasn't attached to his ideas he just was attached to a goal and unfortunately for him but fortunately for the world he sped up a timeline that he set for himself like they all do because he panicked and if that hadn't been the case things could have been so much worse the numbers that if he had been successful would have been like it would have been ridiculous ridiculously high compared to the deaths of 9-11 if he had been successful I mean, that's with, with how the, bad it was. The, the sarin attacks, we're talking about a dozen people who actually died. I mean, yeah. thousands and thousands were injured, and, uh, you know, but yes, it, it could have been substantially worse. Well, yeah. and they wouldn't stop, you know, if they didn't, I mean, get as dismantled as they are currently, question mark. Um, then I absolutely lost my train of thought. It crashed. <laughs> I think I get what you're saying, though. But I think the reason that it was halted is because they don't have him anymore. Yeah. Yes. So if he didn't like, did he get caught? I'm unclear about that. I don't know. Oh. Is to he him still exactly? alive? Is he dead? Is he alive? Did he get caught? I think he's in jail? prison if he's still alive. Okay, but he did get caught. Oh, definitely. He was arrested. Oh, okay. So that was my point. Then Pretty he wouldn't sure. stop. You know, if he hadn't gotten caught and he did get away with that, like there would be all the deaths from that incident and then there would be all the deaths from the next incident he pulled and the next he just i don't think he would stop until he did get stopped or killed so to bring shoko on home uh he was sentenced to death in 2004 Mm -hmm. he ran out of appeals in 2011 but his execution was postponed so that he could um because of the arrests of other members he was executed in 2018 yeah oh wow yeah i just found that too yeah so for people who need some closure (laughs) there you go yeah (laughs) i also (sighs) did find the name of the anime oh what 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 was it uh it is shotsu sekai there you go should Um, you want to get on a watch list i think it's like the episodes are only like a minute long like it's not supposed to be like a full show it's like an advertisement campaign i'm pretty sure and it's a series of episodes huh? yeah i don't know how many though i've only watched like the first one because i was very uncomfortable and weirded out and <laughs> oh, i was like sure. i should stop watching this this is <laughs> enough yeah maybe you stayed off the watch list i don't know because i just looked it up again so <laughs> i know i i look up so many things in our research man Ooh. yeah all right bring us on home uh, uh, <laughs> I, uh, I this hereby... is what you wanted to do at the beginning. I know, <laughs> but not the beginning of it. Uh, I hereby adjourn and declare close this order of this, this secret, wait, this meeting. This meeting of? The secret meeting of the order of alchemical. It's not secret. It's not secret. This... <laughs> <laughs> Nikki meeting. has heard me say that so many times. This, this meeting of the the uh, us the alchemical actors <laughs> until such a time as we can get together and do it again. There it is. Finally, <laughs> we got it out. I'm so sorry. Uh, so that's it for uh, Aum Shinrikyo. Uh, we're gonna go ahead over to China next for uh, an episode on Falun Gong. Oh. Yeah, uh, who is is not 
not so deadly. Um, and in, in fact, in my opinion, I've said this a couple times at, at the closing of these episodes, but I do not believe Falun Gong is responsible for any of the things the Chinese government blames them for. But uh, that's sort of what makes them so fascinating, that they're blamed for committing horrendous acts, uh, but are probably fairly innocent. Mm. So, uh, my name is Dr. Robert C. Thompson. I am your Supreme Hierophant, joined this day by our metallurgic prophet, Brie Litterall. Bye, guys. Don't start or join a cult, please. No, don't do that. <laughs> and our naked truth, uh, Nikki Heller Henderson. And if you do join a cult, make sure it's a peaceful one. Right, like this, like us. We mail <laughs> each other bathwater, we podcast. We can have sex with whoever we want. Right? I make yeah. you isolate every few weeks into a closet with your clothes off. That's it. That's all I ask. Exactly. Just every few weeks. A it's... nice, peaceful cult. Right. You know? <laughs> so, speaking of which, join our Patreon. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> thanks for joining us. Catch us next time here on A Call Confessions.